Hey everybody, tonight's video is called Emptiness and Shame, and tonight we continue our pass-through study here in the book of Jeremiah. We're looking at the nature of Israel's sin, along with the analogy of broken cisterns. So from today's chapter through chapter 6, we're going to be looking at Jeremiah use many vivid images to indict Judah for unfaithfulness to God and to warn of certain judgments if the nation refused to repent and return to God. So we're going to see a lot of times uh, Judah's going to get roasted some, and we're going to see them being called to repent, and we're going to see judgment throughout this chapter today. So Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, it says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the heron of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your betrothal, when you went after me in the wilderness in a land not sown. Israel was holiness to the Lord, the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him will offend. Disaster will come upon them, says the Lord. So Jeremiah, he pointed to the sensitivity of the Lord and his care for them in the early history. And after centuries, we see many were far from God, whom they had forsaken deep in their idolatry and without true salvation. And Israel, back in the book of Exodus 19, verse 5 and 6, was the first to worship the true God of Israel through his covenant in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3 with Abraham which also assured his intent to bless people from all nations, as we'll look deeper in our study of the book of Jeremiah in Jeremiah chap chapter 16, which I believe is going to be right around mid-October. So, note in Bible writing that cities were personified as feminine within the Hebrew language. And in Ezekiel 22, verse 26, Israel has been dedicated to the Lord. And incurred guilt is offense resulting from unauthorized handling of holy things. And take note that God often refers to Judah and Jerusalem as Israel. So don't let the language and the terms mix you up here. When you see in the book of Jeremiah speaking about Israel, it's mostly focused on the southern kingdom of Israel. Though the northern kingdom of Israel fell to the Assyrians also 100 years earlier before Jeremiah's work as a prophet. And so verse 4 through 8, it says, Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, What injustice have your fathers found in me, that they have gone far from me, have followed idols, and have become idolaters? Neither did they say, Where is the Lord, who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness, through a land of desert and pits, deserts and pits, through a land of drought and the shadow of death, through a land that no one crossed and where no one dwelt? I brought you into a bountiful country to eat its fruit and its goodness, but when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priests did not say, Where is the Lord? And those who handled the law did not know me. The rulers also transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. So in verses 4 through 8, we see that God called the house of Israel to account for their rejection of him and their pursuit of idols. And he asked to know what fault there was in him that caused their idolatry. And it's kind of like God speaking like the parent who has a child that goes through a dark time. And they go down the avenue of being criminal in nature and all that. And so God is speaking here through Jeremiah like a kid in trouble with legal troubles and sometimes the parents ask where did I go wrong why did my child turn out this way and God reminds Israel of how good and kind he had been to them giving them the bountiful land 
country of Canaan. And this speaks of 800 years earlier before Jeremiah's time. And we're not better. Sometimes we take the blessings of God for granted, and sometimes in the same week. God could bless us today on Monday at the time of this recording, and by the end of this week, we're going to forget about that blessing. We're not, we're not going to show our gratitude. Sometimes it's the same day. Sometimes God will bless us, and right away we are ungrateful. We don't recognize God. And they defiled God's land with idolatry. And religious leaders didn't serve God or the people well. They didn't seek the Lord, and they didn't teach the word of God from a personal relationship with the Lord. And the leaders, the religious leaders that I'm talking about here in Jeremiah are the priests and the Levites. And what they did is they were bad influences. They set up idolatrous pattern, and they did harm, not good. In verse 9 and 10, it says, Therefore, I will bring charges against you, says the Lord, and against your children's children, I will bring charges. For pass beyond the coast of Cyprus and see, send to Kedar and consider diligently and see if there had been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods, which are not gods? But my people have changed their glory for what does not profit. Be astonished, O heavens, at this and be horribly afraid. Be, be very desolate, says the Lord. So these words are a little harsh to take in for us sometimes. And so we see the courtroom metaphor is resumed here that we can also find in the book of Hosea chapter 4 verse 1 and Micah chapter 6 verse 1 and 2. And the heathen nations were faithful to their gods even though their gods did nothing for them. Yet Israel that's blessed in innumerable ways by the Lord they turned from him. They they did, you know, about a like a 180s turn away from God, while God blessed them many ways. And in verse, in one sentence summarized, wait until your father comes home, you're getting a whooping. That's pretty much what I take out of the passage when we read these verses. Like, you did this, you just wait. Wait till, wait till later. In uh, verse 13, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So Israel had abandoned the source of spiritual salvation and sustenance, and the Lord God of Israel. And Israel turned from the idolatrous objects of trust, in Jeremiah, he goes on to compare these with underground water storage devices for rainwater, which were broken and let water seep out, therefore proven useless. And have you ever had a cup? I've had a coffee cup where I think maybe it wasn't supposed to be dishwasher safe and it makes a little hole at the bottom. So when you pour, you know, a drink in the coffee cup, you start getting drops falling out underneath and eventually over time all that liquid in that cup is leaked out and heaven and earth heaven and earth serve as witnesses of the covenant in Deuteronomy 30 verse 19 Deuteronomy 31 28 and Deuteronomy 32 1 and their idols are useless and empty like a bad sister not able to retain the water that's in it and remember, back in our last study we just finished on last week, a few weeks ago, we went over Isaiah 55, verse 1, that God alone provides life-given water. And he is the never-ending supply of the good, pure, essential supplier of life. And in the ancient Near East, fountains of living water known as the Artesian Spring was special. And it provided constant, good, fresh, life-giving water that came to you. And in ancient Israel, water was a lot of work, but a fountain of living waters brought it right to you. And their works were for a lost cause. So everything they did in their pathway was for a lost cause. 
And in verse 14, it says, Is Israel a servant? Is he homeborn slave? Why is he plundered? So how is it that a people under God's special care are left at the mercy of an enemy like a worthless slave? And in verse 3, God promised that he would defend an obedient Israel. And now through Jeremiah, we see that God asks his people to consider the case of Israel in the sense of the northern kingdom that was conquered by the Assyrians, and to remember why they were taken now as slaves. In verse 15, it says, The young lions roared at him and growled. They made his land waste. His cities are burned without inhabitant. So we see the figure in verse 15 of young lions representing invading soldiers that burned cities, perhaps a reference to the disaster from the Babylonians during Jehoiakim's fourth year, and again three years later when he relied on Egypt back in 2 Kings 24, verse 1 and 2. And they are Judah's enemies, as seen coming up in Jeremiah 4, 7, announcing desolation. In verse 16 it says, Also the people of Noph and Tapanhes, have broken the crown of your head. So Noph and Tapanes, however it's pronounced, were two cities in Egypt that stood for the country itself. And sometimes Noph is sometimes referred to in Scripture, depending on your translation, as Memphis. But don't think of Memphis in the United States of Tennessee, because nothing good comes out of Memphis Tennessee and Memphis, Tennessee did not exist at, you know, 500 years before Christ and such. And uh, Egypt and Babylon contended over who would control Judah. And the crown is likely a reference to Josiah, who's killed by Nero at the Battle of Megiddo. And, or Necho, not Nero. Nero was like 70, around the 60 ADs years. Necho at the Battle of Megiddo in 609 BC, back in 2 Kings 23, verse 29. And if you like geography, Memphis is actually the ancient city of the ancient capital of Lower Egypt, near modern Cairo. And Judah was not to trust Egypt. They were not to put their trust in man, but unfortunately, that's what they do. In verse uh, 17 and 18, it says, Have you not brought this on yourself, in that you have forsaken the Lord your God, when he led you in a way? And now why take the road to Egypt, to drink the waters of Sihor? Or why take the road to Assyria, to drink the waters of the river? So verse 17 has a plain reason, as Israel was captive, her people slaves, and the cities are burned because they forsook the Lord. In verse 18, dependence on the allies of Egypt and Assyria was part of the national undoing, a source of shame. And Sihor refers to the Nile River. And drinking of the waters of the Nile or the Euphrates is a metaphor for Judah's place and its hope for deliverance in one of the nations, one of these nations or the other. And yet, like cracked cisterns, they have never delivered the aid that Judah anticipates. In verse 19, it says, Your own wickedness will correct you, and your backsliders will rebuke you. Know, therefore, and see that it is an evil and bitter thing, that you have forsaken the Lord your God, and the fear of me is not in you, says the Lord God of hosts. So backsliding in Hebrew means turning away and turning back or apostasy. And if Jeremiah or if Jerusalem did continue on their destructive course, then there would be more than enough correction and rebuke found in the consequences of their actions. And they feared men, but not the Lord who could destroy them or protect them if they only had repented and trusted in him. In verse 20 through 23, it says, For of old I have broken your yoke and burst your bonds, 
and you said, I will not transgress. When on every hill, high hill, and under every green tree you lay down, playing the harlot, yet I had planted you a noble vine, a seed of highest quality. How then have you turned before me into a degenerate plant of an alien vine? For though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, yet your iniquity is marked before me, says the Lord God. How can you say I am not polluted? I have not gone after the bales? See your way in the valley. Know what you have done. You are swift, drom dromedary, breaking loose in her ways. So High Hill and Green Tree were typical sites of shrines to the gods of Canaan. And Judah is portrayed as a harlot, or some translations might actually use the word whore, unfaithful to the Lord, as seen later in Ezekiel 23, Hosea chapter 3, verse 1 through 5, and Hosea chapter 4, verse 10 through 17. And so symbolically, we see that God calls their idolatry as equivalent to prostitution. And they were often connected with sexual immorality with the use of the, fe the female and male prostitutes. And in verse 21, the vine was metaphoric often for Israel with God as the gardener who cares for the nation, as you can find in Psalm 80, verse 8 through 16, Isaiah chapter 5, which we studied way back in April in Ezekiel 17. And some translations use wild for foreigner or alien. And foreign, foreignness implies to pagan re religious practices. In uh, verse 22, soap and water couldn't purify them, only in repentance toward the Lord himself as the one providing the cleansing that they need through the blood of the everlasting covenant could wash them. Just as we saw a month ago back in Isaiah 53, verse 4 through 6. So they need a Messiah to actually wash them clean. And lye was a powerful cleaning agent at this time, but it wasn't powerful enough to physically take care of spiritual needs. And note that not even OxyClean, I know some of you guys might use OxyClean, we have a big thing oxyclean that we get at costco because when you have toddlers and uh you know children um they're pretty good at making uh stains in their clothing so even oxyclean cannot cleanse you it cannot take the stain of sin out and uh verse 23 said how can you say i am not polluted i have not gone after the bales see your way in the valley know what you have done you are swift dromedary breaking loose in her ways. So Baos is an exclusive term referring collectively to the false deities of canon. And dromedary is a female camel pursuing its instinct and as a wild ass in heat, sniffing the wind to find a mate, craving to attract others of its kind. And we'll see other figurative language coming up for Israel. And there's going to be some language that might be highly offended to you, offensive to you. And the valley is best understood as the Hinnom Valley, south of Jerusalem, where abominable worship practices such as sacri child sacrifice was occurring in Jerusalem's era, as you will find in Jeremiah 7.31 coming up here in the next week or so. In verse 24, 25 says, A wild donkey used to the wilderness that sniffs at the wind and her desire in her time of mating who can turn her away. All those who seek her will not weary themselves. In her month they will find her. Withhold your foot from being unshowed and your throat from thirst. But you said there is no hope. No, I have loved aliens and go after them I will go. So verse 24 is not referring to Democrats. I just want to make that clear when you see a wild donkey being spoken about in the Bible. And wild donkey is a picture of unrestrained lust. And instead of 
needing to be seduced by her lovers or having her affections purchased, she herself is paid to pursue her foreign lovers. And female donkeys and heat often goes after the male with abandon. And they can get violent as she as she sniffs the path in front of her, trying to pick up the scent of a male by his urine. And then she races down the road in search of the mate. And the barefoot and constant thirst were marks of the exile and slave in verse 25. And this was the fate of the northern kingdom of Israel and also would become the fate of Judah if they did not turn to the Lord. In verse 26 through 28 says, As a thief is ashamed when he is found out, So is the house of Israel ashamed, they and their kings and their princes and their priests and their prophets, saying to a tree, You are my father, and to a stone you gave birth to me. For they have turned their back to me and not their face. But in a time of their trouble, they will say, Arise and save us. But where are your gods that you made for yourselves? Let them arise if they can save you in a time of your trouble. For according to the number of your cities are your gods, O Judah. So verse 26 through 28, the thief is only ashamed when he is found out. And many criminals are that way. They have no remorse unless they, they, they find, you know, they're discovered of their crime. And then they really only remorse most of the time is the consequences. And in the same way, Israel under exile was really only sorry for having been caught and suffered and for their sin. And in verse 27, Jeremiah describes the foolish idolatry, worshiping things of like wood and stone. And the tree wooden idol represented Asherah, the leading female Canaanite deity. And the stone represented Baal, the leading male Canaanite deity. And they knew that his people would reject useless idolatry when the great crisis came. Yet God would sarcastically ask, where are your gods that you have made? So Judah, because Judah was into idolatry and her false gods, God is kind of sarcastically here saying, where are your gods? Are they going to be able to help you? Do they have power to help you? In uh, verse 29 through 32, says, why will you plead with me? All you have transgressed against me, says the Lord. In vain I have chastened your children. They receive no correction. Your sword has devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. O generation, see the word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness to Israel or a land of darkness? Why do my people say we are lords? We will come no more to you. In verse 32, can a virgin forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. So God tests the repentance of Israel to see if they would return to him through difficulty. And in verse 30, we see that they were all guilty of pride, believing that they didn't need to come and humble themselves before the living God, we find in verse 31. And Brian, I just want to make sure if you're listening that you highlight verse 31, where it says here, O generation, see the word of the Lord. Have I been in a wilderness to Israel or a land of darkness? Why do my people say we are lords? We will come no more to you. So in verse 30, God's people were guilty of rejecting and murdering the prophets. And such forgetfulness in verse 32, is so unlikely to be virtually impossible. And they forgot the Lord like we looked at back in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. And when God's people forget their God who has done so much for them, it's an offense against that of good and right. And the bridal attire proclaimed her 
status as a married woman like a wedding ring today. In verse 33 through 37, I finished the chapter. I know it's a long video. It's a lot of verses here. It says, why do you beautify your way to seek love? Therefore, you have also to taught the wicked woman of your ways. Also on your skirts is found the blood of the lives of the poor innocents. I have not found it by secret search, but plainly on all of these things. Yet you say, because I am innocent, surely his anger shall turn from me. Behold, I will plead my case against you, because you say, I have not sinned. Why do you gad about so much to change your way? Also, you shall be ashamed of Egypt as you were ashamed of Assyria. Indeed, you will go forth from him with your hands on your head. For the Lord has rejected your trusted allies, and He will, and you will not prosper by them. So Israel felt that the pursuit of love was self-justifying, and any pursuit of love could be considered beautiful. And the love of idols was just as good as the love of their covenant God. That is how their idols made them fail. And beautify was used back in 2 Kings 9.30 of Jezebel's dress in her head. And so for Israel in Jeremiah's day, wasn't enough for them to call their sinful pursuit of love beautiful. They also had to teach it to others. Doesn't that sound very similar today on what we see that people in their sexual sin cannot just live their lives without pushing it down and teaching it to the next generations trying to you know say that these are natural instincts it reminds me much of the lgbtq ideology today and in verse 34 lifeblood refers to the persecution of the weak by the strong and it's a great theme of Amos in Amos chapter 2, verse 6 through 8. And some translations in verse 34 say, you didn't find them breaking in. And the Mosaic law gives homeowners the right to protect their own property against burglars in Exodus 22, verse 2. And I just want to step back here and hit again on the pursuit of love perverted. And it's not just homosexuality of love being perverted but adultery premarital sex and polygamy and people will advocate for their interests in their sexual sinful lifestyles and they hope to normalize it and you know what was once considered an abomination and considered sinful or perverted they want people to see it as normal and unborn children as a result are aborted murdered and homes erect perversion imposes itself on innocence. These are all the aftermath of these sins when they are tolerated and not repented over. And in verse 35, they claim their innocence, but it did not impress God. God's like, you're not really innocent. You guys are out of your mind. And in verse 36, her allies will not be able to help. And to Gad is about is to bounce about on an irregular course and god promised to bring their trust in egypt to nothing and they would go forth from judah as captive slaves and hands on the head is a posture for captives or prisoners of war and you've probably seen the videos back in the iraq war afghanistan war if you never served on tv when you saw things about pow's when they surrender oftentimes they'll do something like this they'll walk up you know like this to show that they're surrendering and sometimes in law enforcement maybe some of you that been wrapped up in the criminal justice system in the past you probably even got to make those gestures yourself as when you're surrendering i've done it in training purposes and besides one call that we had back when i was an mp And so to wrap up tonight, we look at the astonishing nature of Israel's sin by starting with the good old days. And I hear that phrase so often, good old days. But when you look at the sinful lifestyles, there's really been no good old days. In verse 4 to 8, it shows the great ingratitude of rebellious Israel. In Jeremiah 9, 2, 9, uh, verse 
Jeremiah 2, verse 9 to 12, shows us the astonishing nature of Israel's sin. And we look at the emptiness and the shame of their idolatry with broken cisterns in verse 13, used as an illustration. And I want to go over to John chapter 4, verse 10. And we'll be coming up to a, an end here soon. I know we're hitting over a half hour. And you're probably like, we went, we did this in Isaiah too. So John chapter 4, verse 10. Ten through fourteen it says Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as the sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. So God alone provides the life-given waters. And Jesus is the source of the spiritual salvation and sustenance. And in verse 14 through 19 of Jeremiah 2, we saw God's people look to Egypt and Assyria as they forsook the Lord. So when they turned away from God, they, they turned to man. In verse 20 through 25, we see the unrestrained pursuit of the false gods. And I want to go over to John chapter 15, verse 1 through 8. And I think this is going to be a passage we're going to see a few times in our Jeremiah studies here. So John 15, verse 1 through 8, it says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Each branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are, all, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and in, I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit, of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch, and is withered. And they gather them, and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. But this, my Father, is glorified that you bear much fruit, so that you will be my disciples. So Jesus is the true vine, and those who abide in him are the branches. And let's go to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. Hebrews 9, verse 11 through 15 says, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying, purifying of the flesh how much more shall the blood of christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to god cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living god and for this reason he is a mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance so Christ has provided us the eternal redemption. Through his blood, he has provided the cleansing that we need. And 1 John 1, 7 says here, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, 
his son cleanses us from all sin. So, once again, Jesus' blood is what brings us cleansing. It is not OxyClean or anything that we can do to make ourselves clean. In Jeremiah 2, 26 through 28, we see the shame of Israel. And in verse 29, we see that God won't listen to Israel that has rejected him. So God puts his foot down. God's like, all right, you're going to reject me and my word as the sovereign Lord. I'm not going to listen to you. And the chapter ends with Israel will be disappointed in the false gods that they have trusted. And that's going to wrap up today's video. We'll see you next as we'll be looking at a word to backsliders. So we'll focus more on the backsliders term in our next video, which will be on Saturday. So I hope that you have a great rest of your week and we'll see you back here in a couple days. God bless.